Hi, everyone. Uh, so it's my job to do a high level overview of all the single cell technologies you may encounter. Um, so the goal of this talk is not necessarily get into every piece of code or every single uh, algorithm, but really talk more about some of the upfront processes that samples will go through to generate the data that you'll be working with. So all these slides are like all CBW slides are all released under Creative Commons. Uh, so yeah, my talk is really going to be about the introduction, really how to make single cell data. So the goal is a single cell sequencing workshop. Uh, so the first objective is uh, understand that conceptual conceptual shift from bulk to single cell sequencing. Um, think through some of the experimental design decisions and not just preparing the sample, but also the downstream informatics and having a validation plan for anything you find in single cell. So trying to think through the entire experimental design, specifically using single cell technologies. Uh, I'm a cancer researcher, so I'm going to talk a lot about cancer as examples. The goal isn't to teach to have everyone become an expert cancer biologist, but to really introduce some of the things that you can do with single cell technologies uh, as it pertains to cancer cells and the cancer immune microenvironment. And then I'll talk a little bit about the end about multi-omic profiling. So not just RNA, but really all the other single mo uh, molecules that you can now read out at the single cell level. Of MNMs, there are single cell interactions, the structure matters, those cells interacting with each other. Historically, we've just taken tissues, ground them up, extracted their RNA, and analyzed. But I also want to emphasize single cell analysis is really not new. We've been looking at single cells for ages. And actually, this is one of my immune cells. Um, this is a, a karyotype I did as a clinical fellow. It's literally just in the olden days, we're just counting bands and counting now you can do this in a much more quantitative way, much, much more quantitative, and the scale has just exploded. Uh, another example in citro hybridization is actually still a test that's done in the hospital where there's a, a RNA probe. You can measure one file of transcript. Now, now we're gonna, I'm going to talk a little, little bit about the digits. Our technologies are approaching complete transcriptome sequencing within single cells. I alluded to at the start, single cell sequencing is really moving away from average across multiple cells. So this is a little toy example where you have six cells. We're all expression, expressing different RNA transcripts at different colors. If you ground them all up, you get an average of these. So if you did that, they'd all look the same. But if you actually had the ability to dissociate and look at single cells, you can actually see some of those transcriptional dynamics uh, within each cell um, by themselves. Uh, the title of this slide, even though this uh, paper is five years old now, the title has really held up well over time. So there's a huge variety of single cell methods. Uh, and this paper is still, it's aged very well. It's still a, a very relevant uh, introduction to all the technologies and all the things that you can measure from a single cell, um, even back in 2019. And actually, this list is pretty, uh, pretty relevant today. Three broad areas of analysis, lineage, trying to understand how cells develop and how they relate to their progenitor, both in cancer cells and immune cells. Cell state, and that's a bit of a, an existential, existential question. What is a cell? What is a T cell? What is a B cell? There's always another subtype that you can uh, sort of layer on. So measuring cell state, but really think carefully about how you define cell state. How do you label a cell? Um, these seem like simple concepts on their face, but you can see all the technologies that can be used to define the state of a cell. And the third is trajectory. How does the cell population change over time in response to treatment as it develops? Uh, if there's an external selection pressure, and there's a lot of uh, algorithms now that continue to get better and better to infer the relationship of cell populations uh, over time. So I want to start at the beginning. How do you generate single cell data? So this section of the talk is really about uh, considerations and different capabilities that can be brought to bear to purify a cell population, especially if you have a specific group of cells that you're interested in. 
Um, this plot shows the evolution in the number of cells, which is the y-axis, and then over time, which is the x-axis. And you can see just the sheer number of cells that could be profiled in a single reaction has really has this, um, essentially this power, this uh, exponential growth over time. This stops at 2017, but this is actually just kept going. So now it's actually pretty routine to do 10,000 or 100,000 cells in a single reaction. Um, getting to a million is largely budget limited, but I suspect we're going to actually be able to get there relatively soon and sequence all the cells within a tissue biopsy or tissue sample. Uh, in the beginning, it was manual. It was a pipette in an Eppendorf tube. But you can see just over time, this has started to scale as it moved to multiplexing, uh, microfluidics, which a lot of the early single cell work was based around, uh, nanodroplets, which is what the 10x genomics uh, protocol uses. We'll talk a little bit about that specific platform. Uh, Pico wells, so the wells are exactly the size of a cell, so the cell, that cell kind of naturally self-organize uh, into Pico wells. And really where the, the uh, field is now is in spatial transcriptomics, so really using uh, RNA probes and now de novo sequencing in place of an RNA molecule right inside the cell. So there's been this evolution over time, but the concepts are still the same. Expression level, counting reads, quantifying reads, and then using barcodes to map reads back to uh, single cells. And we'll go into that process in uh, some detail. So the first step is how do you get your data? So there's lots of ways to go from a, a complex tissue to a nicely formatted matrix of genes by expression levels. Um, very broadly, at a very high level, there's three general steps. There's tissue digestion and cell purification. So if you're really interested in T cells, you can do that right at the beginning, digest your cell population and pull those, uh, those specific cells out. The secret to doing this at scale is called molecular barcoding. So this is delivering a barcode that's unique to an individual cell. And this is kind of how you unscramble the egg after you've done the sequencing. So you, ha you, you have your cell and the 10x protocol is encapsulated in a, an oil droplet. That oil droplet has one barcode. So one cell gets one barcode. And then when you pop the oil droplet and sequence the barcode, you can tell where that RNA came from. You can map it back to that cell. There's actually lots of strategies to do this. And then bioinformatics, which is why we're all here. How do we sequence? How do we align the data? How do you normalize across cells, across cell types, across samples? Lots of different ways to do this, and you'll explore some of those uh, in this workshop. And each of these steps brings up a lot of questions. So it's extraordinarily important to understand where your data came from, uh, right up to coming out of the mouse or the human or the culture dish, wherever it came from, every single step is going to impact your resulting single cell RNA sequencing data. So especially as a computational biologist, very important to get involved in the lab process and at least very understand a lot of the metadata around how a sample is collected, how the data are generated, because this uh, can completely change how you approach or understand your data. So some of the questions that come up, you want to just sequence all the cells, you want to do an agnostic look at all cells an additional step to isolate cells of interest. Uh, split and sequence. So do you want to have um, one example uh, in the cancer field? What we've done is we'll often digest the cancer, um, a, a tumor rather, split and sort out the cancer cells and the immune cells, but then balance them. So for we want a thousand cells of each type, pull out those two populations, rebalance them, and then sequence them. So you can really get quite, uh, quite creative in the lab. Uh, on the molecular side, are you interested in full-length transcripts? Do you care about exon usage, or are you just counting genes? Can you get away with full-length, with uh, long reads, or do you need long reads, or can you get away with short reads, just counting, uh, just counting transcripts? And sometimes there's a combination. You want long reads to find that novel transcript, and you want to map your short reads in a second experiment to that long read. So you can actually get, again, quite creative at the molecular step. And then this field continues to advance and move extremely quickly. There's lots of algorithms out there and encourage you to really be quite critical of the software and do little benchmarking experiments just so you can really understand the parameters and the effect of tuning some of those parameters in your specific data set. So I just have a slide on, on each of these boxes in general. Uh, this first slide is really all about methods to isolate specific cells. Uh, so I mentioned good old hand, hand pipetting single cells into a well. So you dilute your sample, your, uh, reaction or your uh, your digestion into uh, some volume or it's one cell per 10 microliters or per 20 microliters and then literally pipette them out not very scalable um, microscope so if you have a cell culture dish pulling out individual cells maybe with a certain morphology of interest 
Uh, cell sorting, if you have a cell marker, use flow cytometry to direct single cells to a plate. Laser capture microdissections, especially in cancer, very important, where you have stromally infiltrated cells. Uh, microfluidics, and um, just antibodies to pull cells uh, out of, the, of a, a complex mixture. This is something we do a lot in multiple myeloma, where you have a bone marrow. It's a bit of a bloody mess, but there are tumor cells in there. So we use a, a, an antibody that actually can pull out the cells of interest, and then we discard the other cells. Uh, the other approach, especially if you have frozen tissue, is single nuclei sequencing. So if you have frozen tissues, the problem there is when you freeze, often the cell membrane will will rupture, so your RNA can't necessarily accurately map to a single cell. But all's not lost, because you can actually isolate the more, uh, I guess, the harder core of the nuclei that are more robust to freezing. And this is another uh, approach, especially if you have biobank samples, you can still uh, go through an additional um, uh, nuclei isolation step, works very well for using frozen and bank samples. You can do some isolation, we'll actually often do an isolation for a nuclei marker, to select for intact nuclei. And then those can go into the exact same downstream molecular barcoding methods uh, as you would any other uh, normal cell. Uh, it doesn't come with downside. It does come with downsides. In nuclei, you have a lot of free splicing mRNA, uh, free splicing RNAs. So you actually have a lot of reads that map to introns. Sometimes this is very interesting if you're looking for a fusion breakpoint. Uh, so you're, you can actually use that intronic information, but that experimental decision to use nuclei can really change how, what uh, bioinformatics methods you're going to use downstream and what types of genome variation you're able to detect. Uh, the other challenge I'll just uh, highlight uh, bullet three. In general, when we do nuclei sequencing, the total number of transcripts that are detectable is often lower than if you were to do cytoplasmic or full cell sequencing. Uh, here's a, da a data example where they took a single neuroblastoma tumor, they sequenced whole cells, they isolated nuclei, uh, and then they integrated them together. But what you can see here is even just counting different cell types, these are actually different in the nuclei versus the intact cells. And that's because there is a, an artifact imposed by the act of freezing. So the cells here were processed fresh. So these are all intact. Even just keeping them uh, intact and working with them uh, in the lab can impose a bias. Um, so it is a design decision. How quantitative do you need to be? And if you care about cell quantification, What's your validation method going to be after you do the RNA sequencing? So it's very rare that single cell RNA sequencing is done in a vacuum. There's almost always needs to be a validation step after that. And if your interest is in cell counting or cell quantifying uh, cell types, think and decide on that validation method before you do the single cell experiment. Just so you have all the reagents and all the samples needed to do your first single cell experiment today but also do the, the inevitable validation uh, experiment uh, next week or next month or next year. Uh, I'm not gonna talk about every single single cell technology. There are a lot. Certainly the two most established in the literature are 10X genomics. Uh, this is an end read sequencing technology and full length RNA sequencing first um, published uh, as a protocol called SmartSeq and then SmartSeq2. Uh, so here are two examples really reviewed in great detail in this paper. Uh, 10x genomics uh, chromium. Chromium is just the name of the box. Very cheap, two to four dollars is probably more like one to two dollars now per cell. You can do hundred to hundreds of thousands of cells relatively uh, affordably. There's two protocols: one to read from the three prime end, one to read from the five prime end. You can ca capture different transcripts depending on which end you read from. Uh, you can layer in T cell receptor sequencing, especially using the five prime based uh, protocol. And this is all read out on a, on uh, an Illumina sequencer. Uh, the way this works, um, so you have that oil droplet, you incorporate a single cell per oil droplet, that oil droplet also has a molecular barcode, you burst the oil droplet, and then you sequence the barcodes and count the barcodes and the RNA and map them back to single cells. Uh, SmartSeq2 is much more, um, much more labor intensive, so much more expensive per cell because it's plate based. So you need a method to take your single cells, digest them, put them into individual wells in a plate, those wells, like the oil droplets, have your individual barcodes. You lice the cell, barcode all the RNA, and sequence it just like you would uh, in the 10x protocol. Uh, this has the benefit in that you can do reverse uh, reverse transcriptions. So you can read the entire transcript. You're not beholden to just the little end reads. So if you're very interested in full-length RNA, uh, the SmartSeq2 method is actually um, the technique that you uh, that you want to use. 
Uh, both of these now use Lumina sequencing, but you don't have to. You can use long, re long reads, Nanopore, PacBio. There's lots of ways to sequence DNA now. It's really a question of what do you want to do? Do you really need long reads? Do you have to reconstruct the whole trans the whole transcript, or will short reads uh, suffice? Uh, here's what some real data looks like. So smart. Here's the way to read this. Here's a little toy gene. So three exons. You can see in SmartSeq two, the reads map to exon one. You don't get the intron because it's RNA. Um, you get second intron and the other one. Tanx chromium is different. It pro it primes on the poly A tail, so you're only getting mRNA. So you get coverage really just at one end uh, or the other, depending on your protocol. Sometimes by chance, there's a little poly A stretch in the middle of the gene. So you get little spikes of coverage uh, elsewhere in the transcript. But in general, these are uh, these are end reads. But you can see the major difference in the scale. This 10x chromium has much more than 20 times more cells than the SmartSeq2 approach. It's not better or worse. It's just designed for experiments where you need more cells or more cell replicates. Uh, I mentioned uh, long read sequencing. This is a, a review comparing Illumina sequencing and some of the long reads. With short read sequencing, these are usually 75 to 100 bases. So you take your, your library, you chop it up, you generate short reads, you map them back to generate your assembly. Long read sequencing, you just read all the way across the transcript. So SmartC2 plus long reads is a common, uh, common uh, design because the molecules are essentially staying uh, intact. And lets you answer questions like this. If you have your gene, you really want to know at the single cell level which exons are being used, then you can basically look at differences in coverage. So if your models here, here's four cells all using these exons, two reads that map to single uh, that map to single ex uh, exons. With long read sequencing, you read across the entire transcript and then directly assess whether there are um, your single read. Uh, has any of the sequence that corresponds to the uh, exon of interest. One caveat with the single cell RNA sequencing approach is RNA doesn't equal protein some of the time. And I don't know if that exact percentage is actually true or it has been fully worked out. Sometimes it's hand in glove, RNA equals protein, RNA expression equals protein expression. Not always the case. Um, so this is a, a paper that combined an antibody-based approach with single-cell sequencing. So this is a technique called uh, called SiteSeq. What they did here, they had this complex mixture of cells. They um, they clustered them by their RNA expression profile, uh, and you can see here these uh, candidate cell markers are being expressed at different levels in different cells. And then they did a SiteSeq experiment. And the way this works is just down the side here. You basically have an antibody that's tethered to a DNA barcode. So if the antibody sticks to your cell in your oil droplet, it's going to bring that barcode along for the ride. So when you sequence the barcode associated with that single cell, you'll also sequence the barcode associated with that uh, with that antibody. So that's that you get the RNA, like you would in a conventional experiment, and a protein measurement at the same time. And what this uh, SiteSeq protocol, this original paper showed, was sometimes that mRNA and protein are consistent, but sometimes they're really different. And in some cases, you're actually completely missing certain populations, uh, either in the RNA or in the protein. So it's really a chance to do that cross-validation of RNA and protein at the, at the uh, single cell level. Yes? The steps, yeah. That's true. You'd have the protein, the cell, and the transcript. So you get these very complex um, molecular constructs, and then bioinformatics tools kind of chop up those those indices for you. So Pete, yeah, so this is moving quite quickly. I think this original one, I think this was it. It was like 10. Um, we've done experiments up to, I think, 80 is the lab record. That's as high as we've been able to go. There's definitely companies trying to push this even higher into the thousands, um, but in the published form, it was really small. The uh, The limitation here is the number of um, antibodies that accurately bind your protein of interest and barcodes tethered to them. Um, so yeah, it's a moving target. There's definitely not an antibody for every protein. And definitely some antibodies are better than others. Uh, this has been largely commercialized now by BioLegends. So they basically have a shopping list and you can check off all the proteins of interest. But um, it's not full proteome single cell yet. 
that question. Yeah, and feel free to break in or raise your hand if you have questions as we go. Um, so everything I just talked about was free floating cells in a tube or a plate or an oil droplet. The revolution, especially in the last three to four years, has been the exact same concepts we've already talked about, but without the need to dissociate the tissue. So really just to look at these uh, molecules as they uh, are expressed in place within a tissue. So here's a complex tissue over here on the left, but they make very flashy PowerPoint slides. Informatically, it's surprisingly not that complex. It's essentially just a big matrix of cell by cell and how far they are from each other. So it's really, it's almost the same as looking at a digital photograph. It's just made of pixels and each of those pixels has a, an X and a Y position. So computationally, it's really just uh, another matrix. So you already have a matrix of genes by cells. Now you have a matrix of cells by cells and how far they are from each other. And you can do some really creative work with those two matrices associating the gene expression level to gene position. You could subset your matrix to specific cells of interest. You want to see all the T cells in a tissue. And then you can do some of those distance calculations to compare different cell types, uh, look for adjacent cell types. You can do a lot just with the knowledge of how far is cell A from cell B. And you can do that tens of thousands of times. Uh, this paper actually does a really nice job of introducing that evolution of spatial transcriptomics. Um, relatively recent, I think it's kind of plateaued now. There's really two technologies that are in heavy use, at least at the uh, genomic scores that I lead. Uh, Visium, which is a grid. So you keep the tissue down, you put grid down on top of your tissue. The downside with the rich bigger, the grid was actually roughly eight to 10 cells, but that's pretty good. Each little grid uh, position would give you information on the average of eight to 10 cells. That's changed recently with the launch of the Visium HD platform, uh, which now the grid is actually subcellular. People are trying to pull out subcellular RNA sequencing, uh, subcellular uh, RNA expression. I think in practice, it's basically single cell. The subcellular work is, is quite challenging, um, but that's really where the technology is going. A smaller, as the grids get smaller and smaller, but all the concepts we talked about are all exactly the same. Using reads to count transcripts. Are you interested in full-length transcripts or n-reads? Uh, and it's really a lot of the biology comes from how you prepare your sample up front. Uh, here's one really striking example. Um, these are all done on glass slides. Uh, and when they launched this product, they actually sectioned the mouse pup, um, basically right down the middle of their body. And it was really incredible because you could look at all the RNA transcriptional profiles across every single organ and, and, and across a, an entire uh, mouse pup. So they had a whole mouse atlasing uh, activity where you could look at single single RNA um, or the expression of, of genes at the single cell level across every organ uh, in an entire organism, if your organism can fit on a, sl on a, uh, on a glass slide. Uh, and here are three general applications that the additional knowledge of cell distance can uh, that you can leverage, disease research in general, so we're showing crypt, uh, villi or crypts here, cell-cell uh, interaction, <clears throat> looking at distances between different cells, uh, and then spatial temporal expression, especially during development. How do these cells sort of move and change uh, as an organ develops? So I'm going to introduce some of this yeah, using field I know, cancer. Um, can tumors are not just cancer cells. Tumors are all manner of cells. They have cancer cells. They also have immune cells. And they're changing all the time. The cancer cells are often dividing quite aggressively. They're biologically quite different from these other often immune cells, stromal cells, blood vessels that also infiltrate them. So these technologies are a real opportunity to dissect some of that biology that can be quite complex and quite abnormal within a bulk tumor. And here, this is actually our very first uh, Xenium uh, project uh, ever, maybe a year or so ago. Uh, just to show the uh, the glass slide here, this is the glioblastoma, so a brain tumor. Uh, zooming in specifically on these two pieces of tissue, so this is what uh, hematoxin, eosin stains, this is what pathologists will generally look at to score a, score a tissue. But now you can do so much more, because for each of these cells that you can see by h &E, you can now count how many genes are expressed by every single cell. So the exact same piece of tissue, so we have the h &E, but now you have a gene count, so you can tell even just by eye, boy, these cells sure express more genes than these other ones. There must be something biologically distinct. 
And then you can use all the analysis that we are already um, employing for droplet-based methods to spatial-based methods as well. So you can actually layer on top of the cell identity and start to cluster them together. So even though they're not spatially together, they're transcriptionally together. And we use a new tool called SCGPT. So it's a machine learning method to apply cell labels to cells. And it says these are immune cells, these are probably blood vessels. And then the bulk, which is this big mess of different cell types, that's actually the bulk tumor. And you can kind of see this immune front you can kind of see the blood vessel and then the, the bulk tumor that's in there as well. So, yes. This is not protein. This is all just a single cell. It'll give you a location. I'm hesitant to say it gives you interaction because adjacency doesn't necessarily mean they're interacting. And these cells aren't only interacting in 2D, they're interacting in 3D as well. So there may be a cell above that a cell is interacting with. So you can make those inferences. And that's really where the power of processing large numbers of cells is very important. Because you can say these two cells are more often next to each other than other cells. Uh, and there are a lot of tools that infer ligand receptor interactions. But this method is really just saying these two cells happen to live next to each other. Uh, and then you infer that they may or may not be interacting. But that's where that secondary follow-up experiment often has to come in to prove that genuine interaction, molecular interaction in cells. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You could theoretically spend a lot of money and do serial sections and map the whole thing out. That's certainly been done. Um, yeah, just have a big budget to do it. Yeah, I think each slide is about $8,000. Um, you can do multiple, you saw on this little glass slide, you can do multiple tumors per slide. But uh, new technology, these are often quite expensive, but also these costs inevitably drop really quite aggressively. Okay, at the conceptual level, anyone would like some clarity on or to revisit? Yes. <laughs> Yeah, there is. So flex, I guess it's a hard question to answer because what's what's the gold standard? So flex gives you, within a tissue type, it gives you a more consistent representation of cells and it pauses the sample so you don't have to like process it immediately. I, I don't know whether this, every method is going to have a cell bias and flex is maybe more consistent than other methods in the past. But I can't say that flex is better than manually going through and counting every single cell one by one. Um, but it is a very popular protocol because it relieves that um, need to process a sample immediately. And that's where a ton of bias comes in. If you leave a sample on the bench, even for a few hours, you get huge cell amounts of cell death and huge skews in, in cell representation. And the flex cell preservative method really helps avoid that issue. So often there's some pragmatic just how quickly can you get to a sample? It comes in at like four on a Friday. So you do have to kind of make sure that your whole workflow is robust to how people work, how samples come in, especially in cancer. Surgeries are super unpredictable. Biopsies are unpredictable. So making sure that that upfront lab work is tolerant of that kind of variability. And the flex protocol is a good way to do that. Yes. What do you mean Uh, SiteSeq is currently only done as droplet-based. The Visium method uh, is spatial. That platform is going to probably onboard some protein antibodies probably later this year. So soon you're going to be able to have it all. Uh, I would just, I guess, encourage the group, don't keep chasing the technology. Make a technology decision and run your project systematically using one approach. It's extraordinarily difficult to really integrate all these data, especially if you're trying to pull them in across many different platforms and sequencers, because uh, there's always going to be like twice as many cells or 10,000 more genes or transcripts. Um, but yeah, I can say the Vision platform is soon going to support both protein and RNA. So sometimes it is good to wait.
I saw, yeah. Uh, go ahead. Flex technology, you mentioned that for flows and issue, you should be no AI sequencing, like or the RNA sequencing. But I know that with Flex, you can also see the plus in RNA sequencing yeah. with flows. Yeah, it's all about whether, uh, at least in, in our case, it's whether the samples have to travel. So for us, if a sample is coming from out of town, it has to be frozen and then sent to us. That's when we'll usually do nuclei projects. If there's local and we have control over the sample, then we'll go with, uh, with the flex protocol. So it's really, um, I guess, how convenient the samples are. Um, we are starting to do some remote flex work. But I don't know if I could really recommend without like going through the whole like goal of the experiment, flex versus versus frozen. Frozen is very effective, especially for biobanks if you're pulling out large amounts of tissue. Um, whereas if you have control over the collection, then flex is usually more popular. Uh, yes. So um, thank you. For I have a, a question. First is uh, for the site's sake. Um, so you want to use both surface protein information and the gene expression information. And at the end, when you do the annotation, you actually annotate, uh, like say CD4 T cells, both based on the protein CD4, protein expression, but that's just one gene. But usually when you cluster CD4 cells together, you use a bunch of the messenger RNA. Exactly. So, one gene versus many genes. Yeah, I much prefer the gene set approach versus the single marker approach. And you could kind of see it in that site seek slide. It's not like every cell is beautifully lighting up for an RNA transcript. And even the protein is a little bit spotty. If this was perfect, these would just be sheets of blue and sheets of green. So I typically recommend the gene set approach to come up with a cell identity, if that's your goal, rather than relying on a single marker. Uh, often we'll validate with the protein markers, but I think it's much more robust to put the RNA and the protein into one single analysis and then come up with a protein RNA signature for your cell of interest. I think that's the most powerful. So actually you use both CD4 messenger RNA and the CD4 protein. Exactly. Together. Yeah. So because you have two matrices, so then you can use them both to inform your labeling. Okay. And also for this uh, nuclear messenger RNA, um, I may miss one. So for this uh, uh, cytoplasm RNA, we use the poly A to tag, right? But for the nuclear RNA, what's the technology to tag those RNA? I, I, I may be wrong, but there's no poly A there. Yeah, so there's lots of ways to do it. Sometimes it's random hexamer priming is probably the most, uh, the most common. Um, so yeah, you basically prime all the way across it. Uh, in the SmartSeq, I don't remember how the uh, the smart seek protocol is also poly A. Yeah, I forgot. I think it is all just poly A or hexamer priming, which also introduces its own bias uh, as yeah. well. So if you have re repeats within your transcript, you're going to have bias for or against those regions. Thank you. Last question. Do we still have a time? Yeah, yeah, we have time. So, um, you know, when you talk about this uh, nuclear sequencing is used for the frozen sample, I was just wondering if you are doing inside. Uh, Maybe there's another application is very useful for the nuclear sequencing um, because like us, we develop therapeutics actually kill the cells. So introduce the uh, apoptosis or the lysis yeah. of the cells. So the, you actually, those cells respond to our therapeutics that actually lost their cytoplasm and their cell. Mm. So they're probably capture the nucleus actually is a good way to capture the real responding cell yeah. of the cell. Yeah, so that's exactly the design decision that you'd want to make. And maybe you want to try both. You want to do intact and nuclei. And you can see it in this neuroblastoma example. There are like complete cell populations that are unique to cells or nuclei. And that actually might reflect the type of pattern that you're talking about. Cell dead residual nuclei. Usually if they're dying cells, the nuclei will also not necessarily be viable. So that's where, at least for our nuclear work, we'll always flow sort out for intact nuclei. But yeah, that's actually a pretty interesting biomarker that you could, yeah. uh, you I could think run. then maybe <laughs> just uh, even for the nuclear, right? So they're seeing the cells actually lost some side of plasma. Yep. So we can capture. Otherwise, we actually kind of like bias. We say there's fewer, we underestimate the response. Yeah, and actually in the spatial experiment, um, 
this one here. It was action that we do analysis on the H and E slide. It did actually three single cell sequencing. Uh, and I'll say in practice, specifically in cancer, how do both the cancer cells and the immune cells change over time? I'm going to just talk about two pieces of published work. One looking at early cancer uh, development using the mouse model. And then looking at the uh, single cell RNA seq profile and treatment with a targeted inhibitor. Uh, so the first one, this has been published two different ways. Um, I'm going to focus mostly, I guess, on both of them. Um, but it's really based around this uh, concept in multiple myeloma, where this cancer actually starts uh, in humans and in most models as this monoclonal gamma, a person, usually a senior, uh, who has an MGUS clone, has a 1% chance of that clone turning into cancer. And it turns into this phase called smoldering myeloma. This always progresses eventually to active myeloma. And then patients are treated with the goal that myeloma is incurable, but they're treated with the goal to get them down into minimal residual disease. So we're very interested in how using this mouse model, this first part of the curve, how do you go from healthy mouse to MGUS mouse to full-blown myeloma? Great use of single cell data. So this is a B-Kappa-Mick mouse. It gets cancer basically guaranteed over 70, 72 weeks. Uh, and there's a protein marker that you can track over time. So you can see as a mouse is at the no disease phase, the AMG, which is MGUS for mice, and then full-blown multiple myeloma. So you can follow this protein marker over time. Uh, and this is an opportunity to get these, uh, these cell populations in these three time points. So here's all the data. We have 90,000 cells, 12 mice. We had multiple mice at each of these time points. Uh, we also had some control mice. And since the real power of single cell sequencing, it's all quantitative, it's all digital. So we're actually able to cluster all of these data together into one huge analysis, but also look at each mice, uh, mouse one by one. And the real power, especially bioinformatically, is the ability to zoom in on specific populations that you're interested in. So we knew from cell markers that these were, um, these were the plasma cell populations. So informatically, we're able to take the whole matrix, slice, it, slice out the, um, the can't remember columns or rows associated with the cells of interest, and then recluster them. So you can do a very targeted analysis specifically of plasma cells. So you, this is the whole population. These are only the plasma cell population. And then you can look at the cell labels. And what we found here was all mice had normal plasma cells. In the no disease mice, they had additional three unique populations totally unique to the normal mice. Kind of surprising that these plasma cells weren't necessarily normal cells. We also found um, three of the mice with AMG also had their own distinct population. So we interpreted this as everybody has normal plasma cells. Something goes wrong. Even in the normal mice, we we're calling them normal, but they had this, um, this population that was different from normal plasma cells. We had an additional population, the AMG mice, also unique to them. And then by the time you go to myeloma, they, each mice has their own totally unique clone. So you can see they're not clustering together at all. And the model that we um, we interpret this as, you have these mice, these uh, plasma cells are all the same at the start. They get progressively uh, abnormal, and then they and then they become cancer, just like in humans. They're transcriptionally totally different. You can actually see this over time using the single cell data. Yes. No, they're all pros, and actually, great, uh, great uh, point. We did all these experiments all at once because that's absolutely a risk with this experiment. Don't put all your biological time points in one sequencing run or one run on 10x. Scramble them up as much as you can. You as an informatician do not care for the order or how the samples are processed. So in the lab, make sure you're randomizing your time points, your mice type, your genetic background, your controls really as much as you can. Uh, don't beautifully put time point one in sequencing run or 10x run one. Time point two in in time in the experimental batch two. That's a very bad experimental design. Yeah. So basically, you take in this case, you take the whole mouse femur and flush out all the cells and then sequence them. Um. So that was a nice little question that you could really do a deep dive specifically on uh, plasma cells. Same kind of thing. We looked at the cell marker specifically for T cells. There's a published exhaustion score, and what we saw progressively over time is an increase in this exhaustion score. So essentially, the mouse's immune system was 
fighting back against this malignant clone. But as the clone, um, as the clone basically started to overcome the immune system, these C T cells became exhausted and were unable to uh, further combat myeloma. And then we did a flow cytometry experiment to show there's a direct correlation between time myeloma development and the frequency of these uh, T cell, uh, these exhausted T cells. Uh, we want to go one step further. This is kind of an interesting model for trying to understand that uh, immune cancer interplay. So we actually uh, treated those mice with anti-leg-3, anti-PD-1 antibodies. So we wanted to stop those T cells from becoming exhausted. And you could actually extend these mice's, uh, these mice's, these mouse lives, mice's lives, uh, for a, sig a significant amount of time, but it wasn't perfect. Eventually those T cells just pooped out and they really could not uh, fight that myeloma clone. So while you could extend their lives, really that myeloma clone uh, inevitably uh, took over. But it was a nice validation of hypothesis from this progressive uh, B cell evolution, uh, the countervailing T cell anti-evolution -evol or exhaustion signature, and then trying to do something therapeutically about it in mice. So from an experimental design perspective, this is you want to think all the way through, how is the mouse colony going to work? How are you going to batch the samples? How are you going to do the analysis? How are you going to ask questions and pull out populations of interest? But then when you found something, how do you validate it? And then how do you test the mechanism going back to the mouse? So sort of uh, closing the whole circle. The experiment I wanted to show uh, is actually a study Gary and I did together looking at glioblastoma stem cells. And we had a lot of questions about these progenitor cells uh, that we uh, to give rise to bulk brain tumors. Um, so glioblastoma stem cells are essentially resident within bulk tumors. You have these tumors with individual uh, stem cells within them. Uh, and the hypothesis was chemotherapy kills the bulk, but the stem cells remain. And then they give rise to a new tumor that's genetically distinct. And where we wanted to go with this study is understand stem cells so you can pick them out therapeutically, kill them, and then let the bulk die off because they can't be repopulated. Uh, uh, just like we talked about earlier, approaches to isolate specific cells of interest. And they have two different ways to get brain tumor stem cells. So Sam uses flow cytometry. Peter has a culture-based system. Two different ways to get purified stem cells. They both culture them and expand them, and then we did single cell sequencing. So an experiment or uh, an example where one project could actually have two different ways to isolate a very rare population of interest. So the first question we want to ask, are these stem cells heterogeneous or are, are they big monoclones? So are they just, they're all the same, you grow them up and you sequence them, they're all identical, or even the stem cell population, is there evidence of heterogeneity? So in this case, we had 29 patient-derived stem cells, and we did 10x uh, and read sequencing. And here's what all the data looks like. So each dot is a cell, and then they're colored by their, by their transcriptional identity. And what we found was these cells up here at the top had two subclones, two transcriptional subclones. Uh, almost invariably, it was always one. Uh, it was explainable by cell cycle. So often there was a cycling population and then uh, a cell population that was elsewhere in the cell cycle. But then you can see as you go further on this chart, you start to see additional subclones as well. And these are actually genuine, true genetic clones. So even in the, uh, the cancer stem cell population, there were cytogenetic chromosomal changes that were actually detectable uh, at the single cell level. And then the, the most complex was this IDH mutant. This is already known to be a very highly genetically heterogeneous uh, cancer type. And we actually saw that in the single cell data as well. Even though we're focused on RNA, um, it's actually possible to infer the presence of DNA copy number changes as well, just by looking at all the genes within a chromosome arm or sometimes a cytoband, so sub-chromosome arm. Uh, the way that to read this, each row here is a cell, each column is a different uh, bucket across the entire genome. And you can see here, there's some where all the genes on chromosome seven, that is seven Q, are all overexpressed. It's a very common amplicon within glioblastoma. This subpopulation of cells has lost 10, but not all of them. So all the genes on chromosome 10 are downregulated or not, they're actually not there. So of course they're not expressed. And you can play this game forever. You can find sub sub clones, so chromosome 21, if you squint hard enough, you can pick out a sub, 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 sub population. The question here is, how deep do you want to go? You can bioinformatics yourself down to single cells, or our interest here was at the larger cell population uh, level. 
our question was, okay, these were all different. We tried to cluster the patients together. We could never get the tumors to cluster, just like in the myeloma mice. They were so transcriptionally different, we couldn't necessarily get them to integrate. So we wanted to ask the question, do they share any common biology? Tumors from the same person were more transcriptionally the same, but not identical. Um, but what we did find when we did a gene set enrichment analysis is there were two gradients. There was one principal component that was associated with development. So some of these tumors are very strong for fundamental development uh, populate, uh, developmental gene sets. And on the other side, really non-overlapping those cells were an injury response gradient. So this was another, uh, the other side of PC1, um, really those cells being totally different. They didn't have this developmental signature. They had this injury response signature. They're actually almost mutually exclusive. So you take all those, uh, the cells from all these patients, you're really either a developmental uh, stem cell or an injury response stem cell. Some of these in the middle kind of had this blended, uh, this blended protocol, but it really changed how we were thinking of glioblastoma stem cells, which originally was all about bucketing. We want to put them in class one, class two, class three. And we thought about it as a transcriptional gradient instead. And that actually held up pretty well because we had a large cohort of glioblastoma stem cells where we had the injury response ones over here and the developmental response ones over there, really scoring out individual cells, but mapping them uh, along that gradient within patients and then across patients. And then when we moved to ball tumors, we actually saw the exact same thing. The challenge they're only sort of peeking out of the each of these distributions. So you can kind of see these little peaks that are kind of hiding in there. Um, this is essentially being obscured by the bulk tumor. So the, the entire tumor isn't a stem cell. It's spinning off all these other abnormal cells. So that stem cell population was, uh, was in there, but you couldn't necessarily see it using bulk sequencing because you had that bulk tumor of uh, non-glioblastoma stem cells that actually made up uh, the bulk of the tissue. Uh, and looking at those, those gradients, if you took the stem cells, they existed on the developmental to injury response gradient, but they were spinning off of these other cells that are actually on this astrocytic lineage. So the transcriptional axes between the stem cells and then all the abnormal astrocytes that they were spinning up that actually make the bulk of the, uh, the tumor. And we use this uh, algorithm called SC Velo. It actually lets you put this on a gradient. So you could actually see the abnormal cells flowing out of the stem cell population transcriptionally. Uh, and then I harped on experimental design. So there was one last step with collaboration with Stefan Anger. He took some of the markers that we'd found by RNA and he performed a CRISPR screen and recapitulated what we'd seen in the RNA, in this case, using a, 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 a CRISPR screen and really showing that the exact same populations that were dependent or expressing injury or development uh, populations were also dependent on trend on genes um, that supported those those uh, those gene sets as well. So the exact same genes that were very heavy on the uh, injury uh, end of the gradient were also dependent on genes from that from that pathway. So really trying to use functional genomics to validate what we saw in the RNA. And actually at that time when we published that work, there was a whole fountain of other groups that had found very similar types of gradients, but using other technologies. So this was actually a review that reviewed all those simultaneously. They looked at the stem cell gradient. There was also a metabolism gradient, a mitochondrial expression gradient, uh, a stem cell differentiation gradient, and they were all roughly correlating with each other. So the observation at that time was really, there's multiple different tools really to read out the same type of biology. Uh, no one has quite yet put this into one master, read everything from every single cell, but theoretically one could do that if you want to do this all in multi-omic type analysis. So my last two slides are really about um, what happens in real patients. So everything I showed was all uh, done using models. So I just wanted to focus here. So this is a patient who's on a, an FGFR3 inhibitor, patient with multiple myeloma. So it's not mouse patients anymore, it's real patient. Um, and to get into this trial, you had to have an FGFR3 mutation. That was the requirement. So you want FGFR3 activating mutation, and you get a drug that shuts down FGFR3. So this is their bone marrow, same sort of thing. We sequenced their single, um, their, their bone marrow sample, just like we did in the mouse. You can pull out the T cells and the myeloma cells. So bioinformatics, you pull out the T cells and you can label them, see if they're exhausted or not. You can also pull out the myeloma cells do the same copy number trick that I showed in the, the brain tumor experiment, 
do the same thing with this patient sample. You can see gain of 1Q, you can see DEL13, you can see um, changes on 17. All these were known from cytogenetic tests that these patients already get, so it was a nice possibility to cross-validate. Uh, but you could also build a subclonal tree by looking at these copy number changes. So just like in the brain tumor experiment, where you could look at sub-sub-subclones, you could do the same thing in human. So in this case, there were four subclones if you put the data from the pretreatment and the post-treatment bone marrows together. The other interesting thing, since we knew there was a FGFR3 mutation, you could zoom right into the read supporting that mutation and actually find that it was an in-frame deletion within FGFR3. And so you could actually find the exact reads that had that mutation because we were doing the sequencing. So we're very interested in this FGFR3 uh, mutation. But when you looked at all the reads that supported the mutation, they were only ever in subclone C2. We never saw them in any of the other clones. Uh, and what was actually happening in pretreatment, you had the cluster C2 that had the mutant, but you also had cluster C1, this one here, that didn't have the mutation. So the patient actually did, um, actually failed FGFR3 treatment. And you can actually see cluster 2 completely vanished. The drug actually worked extremely well. It totally killed the clone that it should have. But then you had this huge relapse clone that arose from the non-mutant clone. So it was a problem with the clinical test where you grounded up, sequenced it, found FGFR3, you thought, great, they should do wonderfully on this therapy. But since there wasn't subclonal information, there was no foreknowledge of these two subclones, one mutant and one not. And actually, this drug subsequently failed and was taken off the market. Even though it's a really, really good drug, it perfectly picks out exactly the clone that it should. The problem with multiple myeloma is it's notoriously heterogeneous. So just picking off one clone is not the way to go for that disease. It needs some other approach, perhaps one that could be discovered from single cell data. So here's my last slide. Um, I hope you appreciate there's lots of ways to generate single cell data. You can now look at cell biology at a totally new resolution that you couldn't using bulk RNA sequencing. The same biology can measure multiple ways, RNA, protein, full length RNA, short reads. There's lots of ways to get to the same biological answer. So tailor your experiment for the technology you have, the types of samples you have, whoever you're collaborating with, and what technology do you have available locally. Uh, you can read multiple cellular components. So you can get immune cells, you can get cancer cells. The most exciting, at least in cancer, I think, are putting the two together. And be critical of your data. Do a lot of QC, fact check your biological conclusion, great discussion on batch effect. You definitely want to have that information when you think you see a big difference between two, uh, two cell populations and validate them using orthogonal experiments, a protein experiment, a CRISPR screen, clinically um, optical techniques. There's lots of ways to validate what you're seeing in RNA-seq. But RNA-seq is a, it's a knife and a fork. It's a tool. You need to validate the, um, the results that you're getting out of that tool. And here's all the references I've shown throughout the talk. I also highlight our brain single cell experiment uh, initiative, which is sponsoring this workshop. If you're working on brain, we have some funding to give big discounts specifically to anything to do with the brain, uh, and then early access to some of the new uh, spatial transcriptomic uh, technologies as well. I also plug our panoramics group. This is our single cell working group here. It started as the Toronto single cell working group. Now it's people all over the world. It's basically a Slack channel. Uh, they also run, uh, they have invited speakers and it's all uh, done virtually if you want to join that.